Now, Philemon. I kind of said it's in the New Testament because nobody ever reads it. Don't even know where it's at. But it's in the New Testament. And it's only one chapter. So if people do read it, it's like, and they go to the next one. You would think, Philemon, you know, what's in Philemon? Uh, <laughs> we're getting ready to find out. And we're going to see if the Lord can change this, okay? Because we, some people read Philemon and they're like, yeah, I read it. And like, yeah, nah. We're going to see if the Lord can change the way we look at Philemon. Now, first, I want to give you a little background on Paul. Because Paul's the one that's writing the letter to Philemon, okay? So I want to give you a little background on Paul. And up until Paul came on the scene, they were already uh, persecuting the church of Jesus. They were already doing that. Most of them were directed to the apostles, the disciples, and those who were following them. That's who they were directing their persecution to. And Stephen had already been put to death at this time. Before Paul even, well, that's when Paul came on the scene. Because Paul was there when they stoned Stephen. Right. And he was just a young man, Acts 7.58. And cast him out of the city, talking, speaking about Stephen, and stoned him. And the witness lay down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul, which we know later his name was changed from Saul to Paul. But at a young man, Saul was there. So they were already persecuting the church. And Paul was a very religious man, very religious man. Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. You know what I was like when I, now this is Paul speaking to the Jews now. He's gotten born again, but he's, he's telling them what he was like. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church and did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. Like I said, Paul was a Jew. He was circumcised. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He uh, Philippians 2. 3 5. I w this is Paul again. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of ben Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there was ever one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish laws. Again, Paul was a very religious man. Very, he's saying right here, he's, he was very religious. He had more zeal than the religious leaders. Paul was very much against the believers of Jesus. That's what it says. He did, he did his best to destroy the church. He did his best to destroy the church of believers. <clears throat> he was not going to leave the belief of his family. He wasn't going to leave the way he was raised. This is the way he, he was a Jew from the beginning, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was not going to leave uh, the belief of, of his family as far as the religious leaders. Being in that religion, he wasn't going to leave it. He grew up following all this false religion. He grew up following lost religion and their traditions. That's what he did. When Paul was lost, he had many Christians put into prison. This is Paul now. Paul was... But we're going to see what the Lord can do. Right. What the Lord can do. Acts 8 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. This is what he would do. Saul caused more disorder, more confusion, and did his best to ruin the church. This is what Paul was doing. We have religious people today. We have religious people today trying to confuse believers, especially coming from the family. Because some of us come from a family that, uh, I'm sorry, but it's a false religion. Okay? It's a false religion, and we need, we need to learn from this. Paul was very religious, but he grew up in a false religion. So he tried to ruin 
God's church, the church of Jesus. He tried to ruin it because he didn't like what they uh, believed. It took power away from his religious leaders that he had very much respect for. Fathers and mothers have a big influence on their kids, okay? And they pretty much not demand them or order them, but they, the kids usually follow. Whatever religion mom and dad's in, they're going to follow it. That's the way they were raised. This is why the Lord said in Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sister, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So if you hear the words of God and you stay in the religion you know that's not of God, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple. You can't be. So when he says hate, of course, we had to teach him that. It's not that you're supposed to hate your parents because the Ten Commandments said to honor them. And there's no contradictions in the Bible. But what, he was, what I was teaching there on, on that verse was hate means you are to love God so much, so much. You're, everybody else, admission, everybody else is down here. Like you hate them, but you don't. But that's how far apart it should be between your family and God. This is also the reason the Lord said in, now listen, I, I use this a lot, but you, you got to hear it. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? So if you're, you're in a Christian church, a church of God, a church of Jesus, but your parents or brothers and sisters, whoever, are, are telling you this, well, you need to make up your mind. Because you're going to hate one of them. That's what the Bible says. You can't have two masters. You can't follow this master and this master. You hear me? So we need to make up our mind. Who am I going to follow? Man, which is parents, or God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the choice we have. And this is the way Paul was. This is the way he was. He had to make a choice. His choice was at first to stay with his religion, his false religion. And because he stayed in it, Acts 26, verse 9 and 10, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus of Nazareth. He was totally against the words of Jesus and his name. Now, that's big. When he said, oppose the very name, back then the name was very important. Because you would, if, we, if you went to go meet somebody, you would say, uh, Jesus would say, like, I'm Jesus, a carpenter. We'd always put our job behind our name. That's the way they did it back then. So that's why it's very important about your name back then. And that's why Paul said to oppose the very name of Jesus. He was blaspheming the name of Jesus. That's what he was doing. The name of Jesus, because that's what he said. He was blaspheming the nine that he was the Messiah. What is blaspheme? When you reject the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. That's blaspheming. He was doing the same, excuse me, he was doing the same thing the devil wants us to do. Because it's what the devil himself himself said in Revelation 13, verse 5 and 6. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. That's what Paul was doing. Exactly this. To blaspheme his name. You see that? He wanted his name. He wanted not just talk about against the beliefs, but he wanted to put down his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. This was Paul, a blasphemer. Verse 10, indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem, authorized by the leading priests. He was authorized by the religious leaders, the ones he sounds like he worshiped. 
I could I cause many believers there to be sent to prison and listen, I cast my vote against them against they against when they were condemned to death. He he put Christians not only in prison, but he, he wanted them dead. He voted with the council, like they did with Jesus, to kill them. This is Paul. Well, this is Saul. Okay? Then Saul, then Saul, seen Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> On his way to the Damascus, he put where he put the believers in prison. He was on the way, he was on his way to put more believers into prison. And as he went, Acts 9, verse 3 through 6 says, And as he, Paul, so as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, it was like having the sun right on you. Not looking at it right on you. That's how it felt. So he knew. He knew all about uh, Jesus. He knew about their beliefs. And he fell to the earth. He knew exactly what to do. Do we do that? When we're in the presence of God? I mean, I've preached on it. And, but uh, like I said before, I've only seen one man. It was a Baptist preacher, believe it or not, who fell flat on the on the. Uh, altar and uh, pray to the Lord. Now he was being a very good example to what we should do. Just like Paul here. He fell to earth. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why prosecutest thou me? Was he doing anything to Jesus? No. But when you mess with Jesus, who are you messing with? You're messing with us. And when you're messing with us, who are you messing with? Jesus. <laughs> and he said, who art, who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? That was a question. Are you Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou prosecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And listen, verse 6. And he trembling and acknowledged said, that's what Paul said. He said, Lord. He called Jesus Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now Paul knew Jesus. He knew all about Jesus. That's why he was killing all the Christians. He knew all about Jesus. But since he was very religious, he refused to believe that way. No, this is... This is the way I grew up. This is what I believe. This is what my ancestors, my parents, and my grandparents, this is what they all believe. So I'm staying here. That's what he did. Right here. When he heard the Lord, he knew who he was. That's why he called him Lord. At first it was a question, who are I? Who art thou? Lord? Are you Lord? But now he's calling them Lord. That's, I mean, verse 6, that's what he, in verse 6, he calls Jesus Lord. Now, we've learned in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, it says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. You can't call Jesus Lord from your heart unless you've got the Holy Spirit on you. You know, you got a lot of people who can say, Lord. But unless it's from the heart, you can only do it through the Holy Spirit. So he called Jesus Lord. The Holy Spirit. When Jesus, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this? I mean, it says, uh, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Not a light like a light bulb. A light. You know how bright Jesus is? That's why, he, that's why we talk about his glory. Because he's so, he's so bright. Right. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, 
reach to follow. Amen. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up in the last days. You cannot come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws you. Uh, let's see. That goes with us witnessing. Because if you're witnessing the right way in the Spirit, that's when they're going to be drawn. That's when they're drawn. It's when you're witnessing in the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't ever, and I said this before, don't ever make up a plan on what you're going to say to somebody. Because if you do that, that's not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. It's hard to believe that, huh? I don't, I don't know. We'll believe it. Why? Because I'm a testimony of it. I, I never plan what I'm going to tell people. The Lord always, the Holy Spirit just gives me the words. Amen. Now, while he, while he was in the city that Jesus told him to go to, he learned more about Jesus. And who he was. And in the city he met a man called Ananias. And the Lord told Ananias to go lay hands on him. On Paul. So he could receive his sight back. Because the Lord took his sight away. You know when you can't see with his eyes. You can see a lot better. When someone's teaching you about the Lord. Amen. Because with these eyes. They'll take you all over the place. But when you don't have this sight here. You can learn better. So the Lord took his sight away, but he told Ananias right here, go lay your hands on him. I'm going to give him his sight back. And Ananias said to Jesus, and this is probably what we would do also, this man was sent with authority of the religious leaders to arrest us. <laughs> and Jesus said in Acts 9, verse 15 and 16, but the Lord, when Ananias said that, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. That, I'm telling you, I think I had a teaching on the name. I think I did. Before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. What, he, what the Lord is saying there, he's going to see what it was when he was uh, making Christians suffer. Now he's going to suffer. For... For I will show him how great thing it must he must suffer. He must suffer for my name's sake. Just like those Christians did, he's going to get the same thing. That's what the Lord is saying. How many times, well, y'all probably don't know the number because I don't know the number. But how many times was Paul put in prison? Several times. Almost all his letters were from prison. <laughs> so was this true? Was the Lord telling him right? Just like you put them in prison, you're going to suffer the same thing. And he did. Now, let me say this before I go any further. The Lord did not change the name of Saul to Paul. You hear that all the time. The Lord changed his name from Saul to Paul. No, he didn't. Paul, Saul, his other name was Paul. But he used his Saul name because Paul was the name that was good for God. So he went with Saul, which was probably from the devil. I don't know. But, but Paul was already there. It was his name. They, he, they just never used it. There's no mention in the Bible about Lord changing them. Until uh, four chapters later. Four chapters later. After this one. When he was sent on his first missionary trip. He went to Patmos, and the governor was interested. He was interested in what Paul was preaching. And in Acts 13, 9, then Saul, he was still Saul, known as Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, the him here was a sorcerer, if you read the, the chapter, who was who was acting as the devil because he didn't want this governor to, to, to listen to Paul or Saul. He didn't want him to listen to him because he knew what Paul was going to tell him. So he did his best to keep him, uh, the governor from listening to him. And this is what the devil does today. He doesn't anyone, he doesn't want, how many of us think we're listen, we, we're, when we witness that this is from the devil? 
I don't think so. So who you think's leading you to witness? It's your God. It's your Father. It's your God. He's the one that's leading you to witness. And the devil is the one that's leading you away from it. And how many of us follow that way? How many of us? Don't raise no hand, but how many of us follow that way? That's a question for you. Now, Paul was a very intelligent man also. Philippians 3, 4. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have any more. Paul said, he's saying right here, he said, if anybody can boast about what he knows, he's the one. He's the one. He's very confident in himself. Because he was an educated man. He was very educated. Paul was a very educated. He, he learned all the Hebrew, the, the, the Mosaic laws, the, the Pharisees. He, he, he studied all of them. So he was a very educated man when it came to the law. And like I, like I said, he had more zeal. Knew more about the law than everyone else. So he was very intelligent. Now, this shows right here, people who are very intelligent are hard to reach for the Lord. They are hard to reach because they think they know it already. But they can be reached. If Paul was reached, then, uh, then if you know a person that, that acts this way, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, they can be reached. Don't give up on them. Now that we know who Paul is, now we can go to the teaching. <laughs> now, Paul was writing to Philemon about a slave that he met in prison. He was called Omesonis. Omesonis was in prison with Paul. And we'll see the reason for this letter is to show that Philemon is, a, is an obedient brother and walks with the Lord. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, on to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Paul says he's a prisoner for preaching in his name, for preaching the word of God. That's why he's in prison, for professing the name of Jesus. Are we ready to be like Paul? It's not too bad right now. You know, we can easily witness. I mean, if we can't do it now, when it's, we don't get hurt for it. If we can't do it now, what makes us think we're going to do it when it does get bad out there? When they say, hey, you can't mention his name. In fact, you can't have church no more. And believe me, people, the time's coming. It's already in other nations, so why can't it happen here? Why? Are we more special? No. True born-again Christians are to be like Paul. True born-again Christians are to be like Paul, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, that's what the devil tells us. That's what he tells us. They're not exactly those words, but that's what he puts on us. And guess what? We listen. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know I talk a lot about witnessing, but we need to put it out there. We do. You know, Jesus was here on earth, and he did it. But now he's given us the Holy Spirit, which I will be having a teaching on the Holy Spirit. But he's given us the Holy Spirit to give us power, to give us wisdom, to know how to speak to these people. He's given it to us. We're his ambassadors. He's given us the ministry. And many of us, we don't do it. So listen to me. It's pretty simple. It's real simple. Uh, are you listening to the devil? Or are you listening to the Lord? Are you witnessing? Or are you not witnessing? So if you're not witnessing, who are you listening to? Did the devil die and suffer on the cross for you? I could go on, but I'm going to leave that right there. But y'all need, please hear the words. 2 Timothy 1.8. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Never, never be ashamed. And don't be ashamed of me either, 
Paul's saying, don't be ashamed of me because I'm in prison. You know, people getting put in jail now, you know, they're looked down at because they're in, they did something. So, you know, but Paul says, don't look at me that way. Even though I'm in prison for him. For who? For the Lord. Amen. With the strength of God, with the strength God gives you, with the strength God's, so we all have it. Who in here says they can't do it? If you say you can't do it, it's because you don't know that you have the strength to do it. Be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. Amen. One day we'll have Christians like that. Right now, uh, we have about this much. Because I see too many who are just the opposite from this. I see too many. Either they're not Christians or they're Christians who are ashamed. Now, has anyone in here ever suffered for the Lord for being a Christian? Has anybody in don't raise no has anybody in here ever suffered for being a Christian? Like they are in other nations where they're being killed. Are they throwing stuff at us over here? Are they doing anything except not wanting to be our friends? Well, that's fine with me because I'd rather the Lord than you. Now, dearly beloved means he's a brother who loves the Lord just as much as Paul. Paul calls him dearly beloved because Paul knows Philemon. He knows he's a man of God. Paul says he's a fellow laborer meaning he's a close friend of Paul's who helped him in his ministry, a, for, a fellow laborer. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are laborers together. So we all help each other. We, all, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You are, you are God's building. So what the Lord is saying, we are the land, and the Lord is billing us to be like him. We're the land and he's building this land to be like him. That's pretty much what he's saying. He's billing us to be like him. And don't raise no hands. How many of us want to be like Jesus? And don't say yes because if you're not witnessing, then you don't want to be like Jesus. Verse 2. And to our beloved Aphia and our Cosmos our fellow soldiers, and the church in thy house. Athea was the wife of Philemon, okay? And their son was Archosbus. Yeah, I don't tell you about these Hebrew names. And he was probably, he was probably the preacher in the church because it says in Colossians 4, 17, and to Archibus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So there's a possibility he was, he was a preacher. Okay? Now after the Lord Jesus resurrected, for 250 years there was no church building. After he resurrected, it was 250 years, no church building. They all met in homes. We had a teaching on that. Roman, Romans 16, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in your house. It plainly says it. Greet the church that is in your house. Why are we in this house? Because we're a church, right? So we're meeting in the house. The church of Philippi, the Philippian church was in town was in a town about 250,000 people. That's about how many people lived in Philippi. They have estimated that there were about 100 to 200 churches in their homes. And they were all called the Church of Philippi. They were all called the same thing. We talked about that before. Now when the weather was good, they met outside. In big fields, they would meet outside. And they pretty much knew all, everybody knew each other. I mean, you go to church uh, daily. Isn't that what the Bible says? They met daily. You're going to get to know everybody. Now, when someone would have some bad times, everybody in the church knew about it. And guess what happened? Everybody helped. Whatever it was, everybody would pitch in to help. Uh, 
That kind of sounds like the Amish, doesn't it? Some people look at the Amish like something's wrong with them. No, they're, they're a people of God. Now, that take it a little bit too far when the, when the Lord says separate yourself from the world. Well, spiritually, we separate ourselves from the world. But they have totally, separ- physically have separated themselves from the world, which it's okay with me. I wouldn't mind being an Amish. My wife tells me I, there's no way I could do it because there's no AC. <laughs> but if one had came across bad times, whatever it may be, they all got together. Amen? Amen. That's the way Christians should be. When I see a brother or sister who needs help, hey, and the Lord lays it on me to help them, I'm going to help them. I'm going to help them. Why? Because he gives to me so I can use whatever he gives me today to help whoever. He didn't give me this money so I could put it in the bank of savings for tomorrow. He didn't do that. Because he told me not to worry about tomorrow. He said he, he's he got tomorrow. So if we're putting money away for retirement, does he have tomorrow or do we have tomorrow? We are taking care of ourselves. And why? Because we don't have enough faith to believe that verse. When the people of the town would see how they would be helping each other, you know, and all that, that would witness to them. That's why the Lord had church in the homes. So the home in the homes, like here, we have this church here. Well, my neighbors, they know, they know exactly what's going on right now. Because I've told them. I told them, hey, I got church on Tuesday nights if you ever want to come. I've told them. Plus, uh, just today, my neighbor came over and, hey, you got a couple of eggs? Uh, I could have. No. Even though I got a dozen in there. <laughs> no, I, no. Man, uh, here, take all you need. I mean, that's just an example. Be a loving, loving Christian neighbor. Even if, it's, even if your neighbor is your enemy, do you hear me? What does God say? Love your enemies. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And it sounds like, man, it's hard to be in a Christian. No, it's not. Not if you're walking in the Spirit. Amen? When you're walking in the Spirit, <laughs> nothing gets to you. You hear me? Nothing. Now, one of the reasons they didn't the one is the reason they didn't build a building because they were taught that Jesus could return at any time. That's what they were taught, that Jesus could return at any time. So they didn't make no long-range planning. You know how long it takes for these churches to be built? Ah, come on, people. Uh, how do you know you, uh, you're going to be here when that church is finished? Because the Lord can come any time. And this is why they didn't build no building. Because they expected the Lord every day. So why are we going to do this if the Lord might come today? Amen? Do you see how they, how they, they thought like Christians? Even now today. Even now today. I quit asking Jody, oh, what are we going to do on when we're retired? I quit asking her that because I'm like, well, how am I going to know I'm going to be here when she retires? Just like Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What's the evil thereof? Worrying about tomorrow. The Christian family stayed together. Sons moving away from mom and dad. That didn't happen. In the Bible, you'll, you read, sons stayed with mom and dad until they both died. Until they both died. I lost a very good job because my boss wanted me to move out of town. I told him, no, I got to take care of my parents. I lost that job. <laughs> but being a Christian and walking with the Lord, what did the Lord do? He gave me another job making the same amount of money. Same amount of money I was making over there. 
God is good. You listen to him, have faith in what he says, he's good. Now, how many, I'm talking about Christian. How many Christian men would do that? Oh, I, I guess I got to go because I don't want to lose this job. God's way for the family was to multiply, stay together. That way, when the parents got old and they needed taken care of, the family was there to, to help. Amen? They would take care of them. Nursing homes were for lost families. Nursing homes are for lost families. I hope y'all hear me. I made the mistake of putting my mother in a nursing home, and she didn't, wasn't there very long at all because the Lord was dealing, me, dealing with me on that. Nursing homes are, not, are for not Christians. Christians are to be together as a family. Like I said, sons don't move up move off to another town and just leave whoever to take care of mom and dad. That doesn't, that's not the Christian way, but that happens very often. Why? Because we live in this world. We see it all the time. It's a worldly way. And you put your, your mom or your dad or both, you put them in a nursing home, you put them somewhere where they don't know nobody. You think they're happy? They want to be with, with their son, with their daughter. That's where they want to be. Like I said, in, ten, ten, in the ten, ten Commandments, what does it say? Honor. Honor father and mother. It doesn't have to say till they die. Because if you read the Bible, it shows till they. Look at uh, uh, Jacob with the 12 sons. He ordered them to go to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. Some of them boys were in their 40s. And he told them, go. And what did they do? They did what daddy said. Y'all hear me? You don't get to the age where, okay, well, you're on your own because my job is, is taking me to another state or whatever. The book of Philemon is only, only one chapter, and this is as far as I'm getting tonight. <laughs> so I'm not going to finish one chapter. Do you think one chapter? Oh, he can do that one night. Uh, sorry. The Lord gives me, a, when I'm studying in there, he gives me a lot to go with these verses. Y'all hear me? Just like the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about this, but it's all about Jesus. Just like these it's about Philemon and Paul and uh, uh, the slave. He was a slave at first. Uh, but there's a lot about that. And it teaches a lot about that. So when you read and study in the Bible, oh my gosh. If you were to study it, uh, you probably wouldn't get through it in this lifetime. Because if you study it, you got to read the verse and study it. Don't just read, 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 read. No, because you're, you're missing a lot. You're missing a lot. But in this Bible study, amen, amen, this body, this Bible study, this church, the Lord has taken this vessel. He's made me a teacher and a preacher. I have to be both because this is a church. Uh, I have to be the teacher and, and, and the preacher, okay? So you're going to Sunday school and the uh, worship service, amen? Which worship service in the church is not worship service, okay? Nobody's worshiping in this worship service is what they call it. They might, they might, might praise the Lord, but most of them are just singing. They're not praising. They're just singing the song. Well, let me get off of that. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord, our God, our everything. It's your words that keep us going, Father. It's your words. It's your words that strengthen us. It's your words that gives us wisdom and knowledge on what to do and what not to do. And we're hungry for that, Lord. We're hungry for it. That's why we're here, because we're hungry. Father God, we can't thank you enough. For the blood of Jesus. We can't thank you enough. Because of his suffering. And 
being crucified on the cross, which like it says, he didn't have to do it. He could have called down a legion of angels, but he did it anyway. He showed us how much love he has for us. So Lord, oh Lord, I pray, I pray that we will do the same to him and show him just how much we love him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.